All right, so while I'm allowing folks to log in right now, I want to introduce myself. My name is Olivia Amaya Ortiz, and I'm an educator here at the School for Advanced Research's Indian Arts Research Center. Tonight, we're doing our next installment of our SAI Artist Live, where viewers get to jump behind the scenes and into the workspaces of many talented artists, one of whom I'm sitting next to right now. Um, before I continue, I want to acknowledge our sponsors. Um, this program is partially funded by the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department and the 1% Lodgers Tax. So today, our guest, I'm sitting with Juanita Growing Thunder Fogarty. She's our current um, artist in residence. She's our 2022 Eric and Barbara Dopkin Native Artist Fellow. Um, she is an amazingly talented Dakota and Nakota um, visual artist who specifically works in quill work and bead work. Um, she has a lot of accolades. She's participated in the Swaya Santa Fe Indian Market for over 30 years. You can see her work in various places like the Herd Museum. She's also had her work in exhibitions at the Smithsonian as well. Um, and with that being said, I will just go ahead and introduce Juanita if you want to say hello to everyone and introduce yourself in your own words. Hi, I'm Ataki Api, Juanita Growing Thunder Fogarty, and I am a traditional uh, Northern Plains beadwork and quill work artist, and I am lucky to be intergenerational with my mother and my daughters. And um, I'm just really blessed to be able to be here and have this fellowship and have the space and time to put into making some traditional Assiniboine dresses. And I'm, it just really makes my heart sing. Yeah, and I should mention, we just welcomed Juanita to our campus about two weeks ago, I think. Yeah. So getting settled in. Getting um, settled in and getting started. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, would you do you want to tell us a bit about your project that you're working on? Yeah, my project is I'm going to be making two um, traditional Assiniboine dresses. Uh, the first one that I'm going to be making is similar to the one that's on the stall in a wool type dress. Uh, my mother has one and had uh, has made them and I've always wanted to make them myself and not had the opportunity and I'm, you know I have it now. Um, you can see my mother's dress at the um, the co-foundation. They have it in their um, collections and so if you're interested you can go there and see that or I don't know if they have a website to, to view that on but um, so it's going to be a traditional wool dress and um, some of the details on on these types of dresses are they have these little beaded pieces in the front that are traditional pieces that um, represent like the womanhood and then the dresses are still cut like the animal shapes and so they'll have like the leg details still on these wool dresses even though they aren't made out of buckskin. So um, I think they like to use the wool because it's cold, cold up north. <laughs> yeah, it's so cold here too. <laughs> A little bit. Awesome. I know that, so your mom has made this dress before and it's with the Co Foundation now. And your these two dress styles are not commonly made, and the beadwork isn't commonly practiced. Um, not too much. There's still people that do it and, and make traditional Assiniboine attire and, and and stuff. But um, I was brought up that if you have the knowledge and the means and the ways to make something like this, then it's your responsibility to make that and pass along that knowledge. And so it's my turn. My mom has made hers. I understand how to make them from her, so I'm gonna make it and show my daughters and um, you know whoever else would like to learn. Can you tell us more about um, what it was like learning from your mother? I think a lot of folks today were like inundated, inundated with technology and being virtually connected, especially in light of the pandemic. So can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, uh, my mother works uh, every day so every day is is the same and we get up and uh work through the dawn hours and through the daylight hours um, we don't really work at night 
And so it's something that is just practiced every day in our household. And you grow up watching it, you grow up seeing it. Um, so you just kind of innately pick it up and learn it. And um, I know it's a blessing. I, I know I've been blessed to be able to have all this knowledge passed along to me from my mother. And hopefully my daughters paid attention. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere out there like, mom. <laughs> Awesome. Maybe um, I'm going to see if I can try to move our camera maybe closer to this dress if you want to point out any details with it. Oh, sure. Okay, so like what I was talking about on the bottom of the dress, there's like still the animal shapes of the legs. You can tell like this is a leg cut. And so these would represent the the bottoms of the legs. And then these would, these little pieces down the center are really traditional and they were represent the woman's uh, motherhood or womanhood. And so they, this one is just trimmed out with buckskin and two different color wools. And the style top on this is called a traditional tea top. And these are all done in size 20 and 22 beads. Very tiny, I don't know if you guys can see those. I should have a yeah. penny up there so you guys can see the difference. <laughs> um, so these types of to tops, we call them tea tops or, or just like a nickname for a t-shirt top. So this is all beaded on moose hide, smoked brain tanned moose, moose hide. And um, I was excited to use these little tiny beads with the brass. And I don't know if you can see the little ridges in them. Oh, yeah. But I got those and they're supposed to be um, over a hundred years old and they were only used on the royalty's clothing so they could identify royalty over in Europe by these beads. So my little girl's a, um, a royalty. <laughs> <laughs> I made her royal. Let's see. Awesome. I'm glad we could take a closer look. Let's see if I can get this to stay up now. Um, yeah, awesome. Cool, I'm glad that we have Instagram to do things like that. Um, so for folks who don't know, you are, you are um, one of five artists in the 2012 exhibition um, at the Denver Art Museum Grand Procession. Oh yeah. And that's where your soft sculpture dolls were featured. I guess for folks who might not be familiar with this art form, could you just tell us a little bit more about, you know, what drives you to make these pieces and what they represent? Okay. Um, so. These pieces, uh, when my mother first started making them, they were dolls, and they started out as children's playthings. And um, there's, when we started out, there's a handful of artists, and then and the other well-known artists that are in the grand procession also are Rhonda Holy Bear and Jamie Okuma. So um, as years went on, these dolls got more and more elaborate. And um, they're historically accurate. So when you look at these, this is the way that we dressed back in this time period. So this would be in the 18, or the 19, early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, probably, early reservation period. So um, we always try to keep everything historically accurate and accurate to the time period and to the tribal style. Um, we try not to, we in my family try not to um, vary too much into other tribes unless we have direct connections like relatives or something. So, because we've done um, like a to honor my nephew, we did a Nimi Poo man, an Nez Perce man, just because they're so beautiful, you know, the, their regalia and everything. So, um, and uh, throughout the years, they've evolved into, we call them soft sculptures now because they're uh, freestanding. They have wire armatures inside of them. They've kind of moved beyond a toy now. And so they're um, fine art. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're preparing to like make a soft sculpture doll, for example, what kind of guides or references help you to, to ensure that things are as accurate as they could be? Um, so I, when I start a doll, I'll just start out with the idea. That's that's all you have is the idea. So I'll do a rough sketch of say, um, we just did a, a, 
a Bodmer style doll for the, the Jocelyn Museum, which is going to have their opening next week, the first, second, third in Omaha, Nebraska. But um, so we had a quick idea of we knew it was going to be Bodmer style, so it had to be 1830s. So we knew all of us have been around and doing this so long that my daughters and my mother and myself all are on the same page. We all knew what we're looking for. We did a rough sketch. And um, so I, I'm the main bodybuilder of the armatures and stuff. So I started out and then built the size. So he's pretty tall. I think he's about 24 inches tall himself. And then we made all the patterns so that they were accurate for his sizing. So everything starts from scratch and just an idea and we do all the pattern making and measurements and stuff just off of uh, memory or photographs. Sometimes we'll see photographs or if we have specifically in mind like a, um, a headdress or something like that, if we have something to reference off of like our, our own personal collection mm -hmm. or whatever, then we'll use that also. Yeah, and that also, I think I've heard you talk before about ledger artwork being oh, a that, valuable resource. Yeah, ledger artwork is, is really um, one of the main things that I used for a tool to teach myself how things were worn correctly and how, because they were so accurate. Like if, if they were wearing um, a bow lance case, in, in the picture, you knew exactly what the sizing was going to be compared to the body style and how it was worn on horseback or standing. And um, that was one of the tools that I used myself to, to learn about the correctness of, of wearing these things properly. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think um, another thing I find interesting is oftentimes uh, folks or some folks might think that traditional native artwork is something that's relegated to the past and you know isn't really practiced anymore. Obviously, you're practicing a traditional art form, but you're living in a contemporary time as well. So there's probably some differences that might arise maybe in terms of how you are able to gather materials or maybe how certain shapes end up being formed. I don't know, could you speak a little bit to just that yeah. dynamic? Yeah, so I'm, um, with it being a modern world, I'm always in, on the lookout for materials and stuff. And so wherever I am, I'm constantly just thinking, okay, is, can I use that somehow? Uh, doesn't matter if I'm in an um, antique store, a trading post, a bead store, a hobby store. I'm always thinking, like, what can I use that for? Can I, can I repurpose that and make it fit? my little smaller things or if I can use it for something larger. Is I don't only do um, the soft sculpture pieces, I do everything uh, traditionally Northern Plains, Dakota and Nakota um, that we would do in our tribal styles. So cradle boards, dresses, dance outfits, horse regalia, mm -hmm. anything that you could think of that our women traditionally did I probably can do. <laughs> or have done. <laughs> yeah, I think okay, that's a good point too. So, for for folks, say you know you have a ceremonial dress that you've created. It's very beautiful for one, and it's probably meticulously crafted and has a lot of detail to it. Um, for some folks who might not be familiar, what kind of what significance does a dress like that hold, or what does it? signify or, or teach beyond being a beautiful object. Okay, so um, specifically, so if we're talking about our Dakota um, dresses that are solid beaded dresses, they would represent a lake, but then you also can teach the young people that you're making it for, or smaller children, you can talk about the lake and all the things that are represented in there with the dragonflies along the edge and the visions that you see inside, like teepees or mountains or, um, you know, they has a turtle back in the, in the center. But then you can also show them that it's the shape of the animal's hide is what you're using for the thing. So these long, pretty, graceful 
ends are the legs of the deer hanging off each, each side. So there's a lot of um, things that go into each individual piece that you're going to make, and they all speak a story. Mm -hmm. I think I've heard you comment before too that you can distinct, like you're able to visually distinguish a piece, whether it's from the reservation period um, or more recently created, based off of whether you see those like organic details of the animal as well. Yeah. Um, so you can see like the older pieces all were more organic and showed like the natural lines of the hides and the legs, and you see the tails used in the shirts and. And then you can see um, later on in reservation period where we had our resources were um, harder to find and harder to source, you can see that you know the styles changed. And so we just had to make do with what we had available, right? So we would use wool for the shirts instead of skins, or we would um, not have enough hide for the shirts or whatever so you cut those off the bottom and and that's you know kind of like adaptation mm -hmm. to your environment mm -hmm. and um so it's it's something that you know you can train yourself to see yeah i think that's so interesting well if it's okay maybe we can take a few more closer looks at the other pieces we have hanging behind us okay let me um talk about this this is uh, my daughter's work um she let me borrow it today um thank you <laughs> we're here <laughs> just <laughs> talking between two cradles uh <laughs> between two cradles if anyone's seen between two ferns so we have um it's they're both assiniboine style cradles and um I'm so proud of her because she was on her own to make this during COVID I'll and it. it turned out great. Let's see if folks can get a closer look. And she has details on the top. Yeah. Just kind and of come around. Yeah, so these are all just things that are personal to her and her family. And then with the smaller cradle, this is a toy size cradle and it's in, done in the Assiniboine style and that's those are all done in micro seed beads, size 16s. And yeah. Cool. I think people can see that fairly up close. Awesome. Okay, cool. So with the dresses that you're working on now, did you specifically kind of do any sketches in preparation for those ones or are you able to visit your mother's dress? I am going to be going over and visiting my mother's <laughs> okay. dress. I um, took measurements off of it a long time ago and sort of had rough sketch patterns for what I'm going to be doing on them and stuff. So um, keeping it fairly close to what she's doing because I like to uphold that tradition of knowledge being passed down and um, and so I don't want to deviate too far from what my mother's done because I know she did it the right way. Mm -hmm. She took the time to learn to do it the right way and so I'm going to do that too. Do you think she'll be able to like physically help at all? I know that she's in California yeah, right she's, now. Yeah, she's planning on coming out to see, see me next month so um, we're hoping I, I imagine she's probably going to jump right in and help me start working away. <laughs> yeah. And then your intention is, is to maybe keep the dress within the family, or do you know yeah. what you're wanting to Oh, yeah. Them? My intention is, is for my daughters to wear it, or for my mother to wear it. Yeah. Both. <laughs> oh, I think that I see a comment from Jess. It says, the doll cradle board, too. Oops, I missed oh, that. Oh, okay. We had another cradle board back here. Oh, yeah, we missed. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see if we can. So that's done in a Cinnaboyne. Right there, yeah. Yeah, so those are all micro beads and the eagle feather designs and a little buffalo. But there's the baby sleeping in there. Yeah, I think folks can see that. And so I just try to source um, the best materials that I can to use for all of these. And so I, you know, try to use all buckskin and moose hide and um period correct materials like these even this wool is like a cross-hatched wool 
it's not on the diagonal. So um, actually, these were sourced from old Mexican jackets. Ooh. And that was just to um, get the proper type of wool. I hope folks can see the quill work that's here as well. It's oh, yeah. Pretty. And then some tiny porcupine quill work. Thanks, Jessa. She's keeping us in line, even yeah. <laughs> over the phone. Awesome. All right, well, 30 minutes flies by pretty fast. So before we sign off, I guess, one more question I have for you is, since we have this platform here now, and we're talking about things of learning and intergenerational knowledge, um, for any young indigenous creatives who might be tuning in, and do you have any messages you'd like to relay or just anything? Yeah, learn, learn anything you can about your culture. It, um, it's our responsibility as natives to pass this along and to carry this forward for our future generations. And so um, it's so important for you to seek knowledge from your elders um, while you can and um, take advantage of that and ask a lot of questions and um, be respectful. The one thing uh, my mother taught me and that I can remember when she was going to elders and learning and, and getting new ideas and techniques and stuff, you take gifts with you. You take them uh, groceries, you can take them blankets, you know, you be respectful to these people because they're, they're your knowledge keepers. And so that was part of our traditions was um, you take care of them. So if you're going to go see them and ask them, ask them for knowledge, you bring them something too. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, you'll be in residence with us until the end of May. So folks, keep an eye out on our SAR calendar, on our website. Um, if you want to register for Juanita's Artist Talk, where we'll have a lot more images to share, we'll be able to talk about and share um, her completed dresses by that point, which I'm really excited to see those. Yeah. Um, do you want to mention again where you're going to, where people can see your work? Sure. Some of the places that you can see our work right now are the Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, at uh, Walt Disney World, at the Epcot Center, in the Museum, Heritage Museum. They're there. <laughs> we, have, we have some dolls there, too. Um, uh, just museums around the country. Um, we're going to be having the opening, I, like I said, about the, the Bodmer show. You can see one of our dolls there uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, at the Jocelyn Museum. Um, and also, there is an Instagram, Growing Thunder Collective. Don't forget about that. There is. Go like our page. Yes, you can follow them <laughs> there. Um, no, I just thank you all for joining us and taking the time. Um, ask a lot of questions of your elders and, you know, seek that knowledge. Okay. Oh, you can follow Growing Thunder Collective, someone said. Yep. Okay. And when this is posted, we'll make sure to tag that account as well. So thanks for sharing your time with us and showing us a little more of okay. your works. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye, folks. <laughs>